History is the story of human beings. No two individuals are alike. Each person has a distinction that makes him or her stand out from all others. The same variety of character and conduct marked Virginians of the Civil War period. How strange it is. For a time before the Civil War, Thomas Jonathan Jackson lived in this home. In the years after the war, Robert Edward Lee occupied the house next door. Lee and Jackson had two things in common. One, both were professional soldiers and both cast their lot with the Confederacy because their native state, Virginia, went that way. They became an unmatched fighting team. And yet in background and personality, they were so different. Robert E. Lee's blood was the bluest of Virginia blue. His father, General Lighthorse Harry Lee, had been a cavalry commander in the Revolution, later a governor. Lee himself graduated second in his class at West Point and then went on to more than 30 years of a distinguished career in the military. He was a hero of the war with Mexico. It was Lee who commanded the troops that put down John Brown's rebellion at Harper's Ferry. But in 1861, the tug of loyalties was simply too great. Offered command of a new Union army being built in Washington to put down the rebellion, Robert E. Lee had to say, I cannot lift my hand against my home. Jackson's life followed a separate path. 17 years younger than Lee, he grew up an orphan in the sparsely populated mountains of West Virginia. Jackson also attended West Point, yet he struggled throughout those four years because of a limited educational background. Nevertheless, by hard work and sheer determination, he graduated in the upper third of his class. Jackson's heroic conduct in the Mexican War stamped him as a soldier of promise. In 1851, he resigned from the Army to become a professor at the Virginia Military Institute in Lexington. For 10 years, Major Jackson taught in the second floor corner room of this barracks building here at VMI. And then in mid-April 1861, he rode down that street with a contingent of cadets bound for Richmond. Thomas Jackson never saw his beloved institute again. Lee began the Civil War as commander of all Virginia forces being organized. He remained a desk general for the first 13 months of the struggle. Meanwhile, Jackson gained the immortal nickname Stonewall at the opening engagement at Manassas. In the spring of 1862, Jackson caught worldwide attention with a brilliant campaign against three Union armies in the Shenandoah Valley. On June 1st, Lee accepted command of the South's premier fighting force, the Army of Northern Virginia. Three weeks later from the Shenandoah Valley, Stonewall Jackson and his divisions joined Lee. These two commanders would be together but 11 months, and yet they became the hope of the entire Southern Confederacy. Both generals were above average in size. Lee stood five feet 11 inches tall and weighed 180 pounds. Jackson was a full six feet tall and weighed 175 pounds. Lee had his black hair and brown eyes. Jackson's hair was brown, his eyes pale blue. Both men possessed deep faith in God. While Lee was courteous, even tempered and sociable, Jackson puzzled people with his silence and lack of personality. He demanded prompt obedience to orders because he himself exhibited complete devotion to duty. Jackson had said that Lee was the only man he would follow blindfolded. Together, the two of them had achieved marvelous things. The Seven Days, Second Manassas, Antietam, and of course their greatest triumph at Chancellorsville. But the cost was terrible. When Jackson was wounded and had his left arm amputated, Lee wrote to him, you have lost your left arm, but I have lost my right. And when Jackson died a few days later on May 10th at Guinea Station, Lee commented, I know not how to replace him, and he never could. In 1865, Lee accepted the presidency of small, impoverished Washington College in Lexington. Here on campus, Lee spent the last five years of his life. When he died in 1870, he was buried beneath the college chapel. A few hundred yards away in the local cemetery lie the remains of his greatest lieutenant, Stonewall Jackson.
Richmond, the Confederate capital, swelled to 10 times its size in the course of the war. However, inside the city's pre-war population were two women who labored bravely, dangerously, yet in opposite directions. Sally Tompkins was born in Matthews County, but was raised in Richmond, Virginia. Um, she was 27 and unmarried at the outbreak of the Civil War. Following the Battle of Manassas in July of 1861, about 1,500 wounded soldiers poured into the city, and there was a massive need for medical facilities. At her own expense, Sally Tompkins uh, fitted up a military hospital. After the crisis passed, the Confederate government decreed that civilian uh, facilities needed to be disbanded. Sally Tompkins Hospital was so professional that an exception was made. To make it legal, she was awarded a commission as a captain in the Confederate Army, the only woman to receive a commission. The hospital survived for the next almost four years. More than 1,300 wounded soldiers flowed through the hospital. Only 73 died. That was the finest mortality rate uh, of any hospital in, in Richmond. Following the war, many soldiers, uh, former patients, uh, proposed to Sally, and she kept saying, poor fellas, they still have their fever. When she died, she was accorded full military honors. Not every Virginian was an ardent Confederate. Just uh, east of Richmond on Church Hill lived Elizabeth Van Loo, an eccentric woman in her early 40s. She was the daughter of a prominent merchant who had grown up with a love of the Union and a loathing for slavery. When war broke out, her sympathies lay with the Union. She received permission to bring food to prisoners in Libby Prison and discovered she could bring out information for the Northern forces. Pretty soon, she had developed a very elaborate spy network that reached all the way to the household of Jefferson Davis. She exaggerated her own eccentricities and allowed the citizens to think of her as Crazy Bet. When war ended, General Grant said that the best military intelligence he got from Richmond was from Elizabeth Van Loo. In the post-war years, then President Grant appointed Van Loo as postmaster of Richmond local citizens would have nothing to do with her. She lived until 1900 with a niece and 40 cats. Her home was confiscated and turned into a hospital for the insane. Virginia has always been considered horse country, so it's no surprise that many of the Confederacy's greatest cavalry leaders were Virginians. Surely the most flamboyant of all Virginia cavalrymen was James Ewell Brown Stewart, better known by his nickname, Jeb. He was only 28 when the war began, a West Point graduate, already a hero of the wars in the plains out west. But he rapidly rose to become Lee's premier cavalryman. Starting as a colonel, he wound up as a lieutenant general. But after only three years of war, he fell mortally wounded in May 1864 at Yellow Tavern. When Lee heard the news, he couldn't believe it. He gave perhaps the highest accolade anyone could give to a cavalryman when he said, he never brought me a piece of false information. John S. Mosby was known as the gray ghost of the Confederacy. A small wisp of a man, he was colonel of the 43rd Virginia Cavalry Battalion. Officially, they were partisan rangers. Unofficially, they were guerrillas who farmed by day and fought by night. In the course of the war, Mosby became famous for nighttime raids, suddenly appearing out of the darkness, destroying his target and disappearing again into the darkness. He never used more than a couple of dozen men at a time. By the end of the war, three northern Virginia counties were known as Mosby's Confederacy, even though they were behind enemy lines. After the war, he became active in Republican Party politics, something that angered most of his southern friends. Mosby lived for 50 years after the war. He never apologized for anything he had done. Mary Boykin Chestnut was a South Carolinian, born in 1823. She was the daughter of a U.S. congressman who would soon become governor of his state. Intelligent, well-educated, 
At 17, she married James Chestnut Jr., son of one of the wealthiest slaveholding families in the state. She was in Montgomery for the formation of the first Provisional Confederate Congress. In Charleston, she was on a rooftop watching the firing on Fort Sumter. And in Richmond, she heard the first strains of the Dead March as all of the casualties from the Battle of First Manassas uh, came into town. Wherever she was for the next four years, her living room formed a salon for the elite of the Confederacy. And Mary Chestnut recorded everything she saw and heard in her diary. After the Civil War, she and her husband returned to South Carolina, and she spent the rest of her life revising her wartime diaries into the finest first-hand account of life inside the Confederacy that we have. Published as a diary from Dixie, a new edition in the 1980s was entitled Mary Chestnut's Civil War. Two men, John Minor Botts and Edmund Ruffin, give us clear examples of the political extremes among Virginians. Those views cost each man dearly. Botts had served in the Virginia legislature in the U.S. Congress for many years. His abolitionist views, his anti-secessionist feelings had so alienated people that Confederate officials arrested him for a period. Botts and his three daughters then moved to an estate at Brandy Station in Culpeper County. Part of the great battle of Brandy Station was fought over his lands. Soldiers killed his cattle, stole his horses, confiscated his corn. But the old man remained unionist and outspoken to the end. Botts died in 1869, penniless and unloved by everyone who knew him. Edmund Ruffin of Virginia had been a pioneering agriculturalist. He wrote many books on scientific agriculture. But he was a rare thing in Virginia, a hardcore secessionist. When secession came, he rushed to Charleston to be president at the firing on Fort Sumter. Then he rushed north to try to be president at the first battle of the war at Bull Run. Thereafter, the war was hard on Ruffin. It ruined his plantation. It destroyed his fortune. And by the end of the war, embittered and angry, he decided on June 18, 1865, to end it all. His final entry in his diary began, I hereby declare my unmitigated hatred to Yankee rule and then he shot himself. In 1861, many Virginians had to choose between conflicting loyalties, North and South. Two who remained with the Union became the architects of Northern victory. Winfield Scott was born on a farm near Petersburg a year before the Constitution made us a nation. He spent 50 years in the Army, a hero of the War of 1812. He won the Mexican War. For 20 years, he was general in chief of the armies of the United States. But by 1861, this magnificent mountain of a man was crumbling with age. He stood six feet, five inches tall, weighed over 300 pounds. Getting in and out of a chair while wheezing and puffing was about as much as he could physically do. And yet Scott had a plan. In 1861, he submitted this memorandum but it was considered so large scale that everyone called it the Anaconda Plan, named for the great serpent that slowly squeezes its victim. And nobody paid much attention to Scott's ideas until U.S. Grant came forward in 1864. He found that memorandum, implemented it, and led the North to victory. George H. Thomas, along with Grant and Sherman, had formed what is called the Great Triumvirate for Northern Success. They were the three generals who most contributed to the victory for the Union. Thomas himself was born in Southampton County, Virginia, attended West Point, served many years on the Western frontier. In 1861, he refused to go with Virginia. He was going to stay with the Union. His sisters promptly disowned him, and he became a soldier without a home. Next to Grant, Thomas was the most outstanding general in the Western theater. A massive man, calm, patient. Nevertheless, he could move fast and attack with pulverizing impact. By the end of the war, he was acclaimed as one of the four or five top generals in that contest. He died in 1870 and is buried not in Virginia, but in the hometown of his wife in New York State.
Walk through any old cemetery in Virginia and you'll come across the graves of Confederate dead. Over 154,000 men from the Old Dominion served in the Confederacy, fathers, sons, husbands, brothers. Each of them had a story to tell. The stories of just two of them illustrate the many. Ted Barkley came from a prominent Lexington family. He was only 17 when he enlisted in the Liberty Hall Volunteers, a company consisting in the main of students from Washington College. That company later became part of the celebrated Stonewall Brigade. Barclay had no illusions about the future when he entered the Army. In one of his first letters home, he wrote, I would like to survive this contest, but if I am to fall, God help me to say, Thy will be done. Barclay participated in a number of major engagements during the war. At Chancellorsville, he wrote, We went over the breastworks with a yell, which was answered with a shower of leaden balls. And later, when he walked over the battlefield, he commented, Their dead lay thick on the ground. Some showed how awful had been their suffering, with teeth clenched and hands buried deeply into the earth. Fortunately, Ted Barkley survived that horrible war. Repeated gallantry in battle ultimately brought Ted Barkley an officer's commission. Yet here at Spotsylvania, in the fighting of May 1864, his luck ran out. He was captured and for the next 13 months he endured hardships at Fort Delaware Prison. Paroled in July 1865, Barclay returned home to Lexington, and in the years thereafter he became a newspaper editor and highly successful businessman. At his death in 1915, Lexington lost one of its most prominent citizens. It is all but impossible to talk about Virginia artillery in the Civil War without mentioning the name of Willie Pegram. Born in Richmond, raised in a prominent and strongly Episcopalian family, Pegram was at the University of Virginia when war interrupted his studies. In 1861, Pegram organized a battery of guns into what became known as the Purcell Artillery. He was 19 years old, and yet he proved so heroic in battle that he was widely called the boy artillerist. Pegram hardly looked the part of a great warrior small, thin, with a high-pitched voice, and eyes so nearsighted that he had to squint through spectacles, he nevertheless sought out battle and seemed to love combat, according to his colleagues. Once warned to be careful in an engagement, Pegram shot back, why should I fear Yankee bums and bullets? I have God's protection. Today, Pegram's remains lie beneath a small gravestone in Richmond's Hollywood Cemetery. A newspaper said of Pegram what could be said of so many Virginia soldiers. He fell in the discharge of his duty and with the philosophy of a Christian.